Hello everyone, this is Mirzai from Cal Poly Pomona and in this lesson, we're going to try to implement the constant method of forecasting in R. Before we get started in R, I just want to refresh your memory on what the constant method of forecasting was. If you recall, constant method of forecasting is a method that we use when we see a horizontal pattern in the data. To see that, select your data set, go under insert, and among the chart option, we want to choose the line charts and then the first option here gives us the line chart or the time series of the data set. Now as you see the data has a horizontal pattern it means that it fluctuates around a kind of average value that seems to be around 20 here. Now in constant method of forecasting the idea is that you use the previous period sales in this case as a prediction for the next period. So I can say the prediction in this period is equal to the demand or sales in the previous period and so forth. So in this method, as you see, you are very limited in the number of uh, forecasting that you can make in the future. For example, we only have actual information uh, up to period 12, so we only can make a prediction for period 13. So you cannot make any projection for a few months after month 13 because we don't have any actual information for them available. So I call this column prediction and what we're trying to do we want to implement this thing in R. We also want to calculate the residuals in R which is the difference between the actual and the predicted value and see if we, if we can come up with the sum square of the residuals in R as well. I'm going to move on to R and discuss how we can implement prediction and uh, calculation of residuals in R. All right, so I opened the R platform. I'm going to go ahead and open a new script. The first thing for you guys is to know where the data set is to download and is available in your course document. If you go under data files, there is chapter five. And under chapter five, you want to look into data set uh, gasoline.xlsx. On. After you download this data set, I want you to save it as a CSV file and then read it to your platform. As you know, the first step for us to make sure that we are uh, able to read the data file is to make sure that we are in the correct work directory. If, we, if you want to know what work directory or folder R is working off of, you can or execute the syntax get wd and that gives you what folder the data is currently uh, being read from and as you see in this uh, case it's being read off of my document folder however my data is available in my download folder so I'm going to go ahead and change that to my download folder and that's the syntax for you to change and set your no uh, new work directory so you use the set wd and put the new address make sure these are forward slash not backward slash so I'm going to change it to downloads. So we set our work directory to go to my download folder. As you see when I execute there is no error. Also if I re-execute get wd by clicking here and hitting control R you see that I executed in the console and I see that my current work directory has changed to the downloads. Now I have to read my file. I'm going to save it in a variable called gas and read.csv allows me to read a csv file. As I uh, mentioned earlier, I previously put it in my download folder. So now that I have the data set in that folder, I can go ahead and read it. As you see, there is no error. If you get any error in this step, it's perhaps you didn't define the folder correctly, so your address is wrong, either the name of the file is incorrect. There might be typo here, there might be typo here, there might be ba backward slash instead of forward slash, uh, or there might be um, another problem and that would be that you guys did not actually put the file in that folder you define on the top here. So make sure this file is already saved as a CSV file in here. Another source of error could be that you don't add the .csv at the very end. So be careful that you execute your two lines here correctly. When you do that, you can highlight and execute gas by hitting Control R in Windows and if you have Mac, it's going to be command enter to execute from your script into the R console. As you see, I have two columns, uh, week, and also we have the cells 
of thousands of gallons per week here in the second column. Now, so the first thing here I'm going to do is to change this long name in, uh, into cells, which is much shorter. To do that, I'm going to use the function names. And then what is the data set that I'm trying to change its name? It's going to be gas, so I'm going to put uh, it inside name. So basically, I'm saying that I'm changing the names of the columns and data set or data frame gas. But am I changing all the columns? No, only I'm changing the second column's header. So you put that in bracket and put the new names a uh, new name in there. So if I execute this line, I change the second column name into cells. If I execute gas again, highlight control R, you see the second name has changed. So feel free to pause and execute these as we go along whenever you have to or rewind if you need to um, see some of these a step one more time. So this is also a good practice to always put a comments line on the top that what you actually did here, changing the second column name into cells. So later when you refer back, uh, you're going to know what you were trying to accomplish in this line. All right, now let's go ahead and add a new column here for prediction. So to do that, I'm going to initialize it with NAs. So to add a new column to gas, I use dollar sign and call it prediction. So that creates a new column. I'm going to initialize it with NAs. So if you execute this line and then highlight gas and execute it, you see a new column of NAs has been added for predictions. Now I know the predictions from row 2 to 12 is going to be exactly equal to cells from row 1 to 11. So that's what I'm going to exactly execute in here. So I want to say in data frame gas column prediction elements from 2 to instead of uh, defining 12 I can say number of row in gas. Because suppose that you have a data set that was really big and you couldn't really see how many row the data set has. So if I just highlight this part and execute it, you see it's 12 in the console. So basically we say prediction from row 2 to 12 is going to be equal to gas sales from column 1 through number of rows minus 1. Instead of putting 11, you can relate it to the number of rows, n row, gas, minus 1. So if your n row is 12, you always can go up to 1 before the last row. That's why you can put n row minus 1. If I execute this part, you see that I get 11. You can put the whole thing in parentheses even if you don't still would work, but to keep it cleaner, I put it in the parentheses. Now if I execute this part, what happens is from row 2 to 12 in your prediction, you replace it with sales from column 1 through 11. Now let's see if we did it right. So if I uh, highlight gas and execute it here, you see that we have prediction. So 17 here is the prediction for the second period, which is the actual sales for the first period. And this pattern has been repeated up to period 12. So obviously in this case uh, for period 13th, we know that the prediction is going to be equal to the cells of the 12th period. However, we don't have that dimension here, so it's not added, but we can go ahead and add a new row here and say for week 13, we don't know the cells, but we have the prediction that is equal to the cells of the 12th period. To do that, you have to create a new data frame gas. I call it n gas, which is equal to row bind which the function rbind shows that when you're combining things by row, basically we're putting the gas data frame on top of another vector, which the first element is 13, the second one we don't have the actual cell, so I put it NA, and prediction is going to be equal to the sales of your gas data set in period 12, in the last uh, period, right, and row gas. So if I close this first parenthesis, which is for vector C, and then the second parenthesis, which is for Rbind, and execute that, I have a new data set. If I execute n gas, you see I just added a new row here, which shows a prediction for period 13, which is equal to the cells of the period 12, and that is 22. So that way you were able to add 
a new row. Basically, this R bind combined this whole gas data frame with a new vector here, and that new vector is right here, which is 13 Na and cells of your previous period or the last period that you had. Now let's go ahead and create a new column called residuals. Again, the way that we uh, work is that we add a new column, very similar to what we did here, but this time we're going to use the NGAS data set. So it's going to be NGAS. New column is called residuals, and then we're going to initialize it with NAs and execute that line. If you, if you look at NGAS, you see residuals is added. Remember that I'm not working on gas data set because gas data set, remember, it only has 12. However, NGAS has 13. We added one extra vector to it. Now, how do I calculate residuals in each period? Residuals is going to be the actual minus prediction. However, whenever it's NA, it's going to populate automatically as NAs. So let's go ahead and do that. So instead of NAs, you can just replace it now with the value that you want to create. So NGAS cells minus NGAS predictions. So if I execute this line and then highlight NGAS and execute it, you see that wherever you had NAs, the result is also NA. So you cannot calculate residuals for the first and last period. Why? Because in the first period, you don't have the prediction. In the last period, you don't have the cells. So you only can calculate residuals for period 2 through 12. Now, if I want to calculate the sum of square of residuals, SSR, I call it in this case, sum of square of residuals, is uh, if I include the first and last period, it's going to be NAs. So to avoid that, you just have to sum from period 2 to 12. So I'm going to say sum, function sum. Uh, remember that also we want to square the residuals. So I have to say residuals that are squared and then sum them up. So I need two parentheses. So I would say sum of the residuals that are squared. So if I execute this line and look at it, it's going to be NA because we have the first and last period as NA. So to avoid that, we restrict that to period 2 to 12, right? Or you can, again, associate this with a number of rows. But for the simplicity, I just leave it at 12. If I execute that and look at SSR, you see 179. So the sum of square of residuals is 179. You can calculate the average of the square of residuals as one of the metric for the accuracy of your model. So mean square of residuals. And in this case, instead of sum, you're going to use mean function. And if I look at that this time, I'm going to see 16.27. Now that gives me the mean square of residuals. Now you can also calculate the mean absolute errors. Uh, to calculate the mean absolute errors, instead of squaring, now you have to calculate the absolute of uh, residuals. So I would say mean absolute residual is going to be equal to the average of your residuals column with the difference that you want to look at the absolute value. So ABS function allows you to execute absolute value of the residuals. And if you execute that and look at the value, you get, again, NA. So make sure that you restrict it to row 2 to 12. And if you do that, mean absolute error is going to be 3.7. So let's change this mean absolute error. And then you can calculate the mean absolute percentage error. And that one, again, is going to be average of the same thing, except that um, every time you want to divide each of these absolute residuals by the actual value. So you divide these absolute values, but their actual, which is instead of residuals, is going to be cells column, right? So for mean absolute percentage error, you're looking at the value of the residuals divided by the actual, and then that is considered as the absolute, and look at the average of them. So, so if I execute this line and look at the mean absolute percentage error, you get about 19%. So now you calculate the mean square of MSC. I call this MSC so that we're consistent with the book. So mean square error, the MSC is 16.2, MAE is 3.7, and MAPE is about 19%. Right, with this, we can conclude this lesson. You can find this code along with your other document in Blackboard. Thank you for watching.